Uh, good afternoon, um, everyone. Thanks a million for taking time out of your busy schedules today to join us for this evening's webinar. Um, my name is Jenny Gibbons, and I'm dairy scientist at AHDB Dairy, and I'm absolutely delighted to be bringing you tonight's webinar on reducing pressure on the foot. And our presenter today is Neil Chesterton, and he's sitting here right next to me in uh, AHDB HQ in, in Stoneley Park. Um, tonight's webinar is uh, being delivered as part of the Euro Dairy Network. This network includes about 14 countries from Ireland to Poland and Sweden to Italy. It aims to put farmers at the centre of practice-based innovation by sharing knowledge and solutions. You can find out more about Euro Dairy uh, by visiting www.eurodairy.eu. So tonight's webinar has actually proved really popular. We have uh, nearly 200 registrations from dairy farmers, vets, nutritionists, consultants, and researchers from right across Europe joining us live this evening. Neil's going to run through his presentation, and then there's going to be time for comments and questions. You're all going to stay muted um, throughout the webinar, but if you've got a question that you would like to ask, then please type your question into the box on the left-hand side of your screens. Um, and I will monitor these questions and ask Neil your question at, when he finishes his presentation. And we'll aim to uh, finish off in about an hour's time. I've got our digital manager, Elena, who's working very hard behind the scenes to endeavor to keep this running as smoothly as possible. So please bear with us if we encounter any te technical difficulties. Um, so without further de uh, delay, I'm delighted to introduce Neil. Uh, Neil graduated with his vet degree from Sydney University in 1974, way before I was born, Neil, and spent 43 years in practice. He has a keen interest in lameness and has been investigating the cause of lameness on his client's farm since the early 80s. Um, but in recent years, um, this interest has focused on the importance of herd management on the farm tracks and also in the milking parlour. His understanding of cow behaviour is resulting in real practical ways for farmers to reduce foot damage and uh, subsequent um, lameness. So Neil, thanks a million for joining us this evening. I'm going to hand over full controls to you now. <laughs> thanks Jenny. And hello all of you out there. I really want to thank AHDB for the opportunity to speak to you all out there. I can't see you, but I'm just believing you're all in the background. So I'm hoping this will be an interesting talk tonight. I come with a background of experience of lameness in pasture-based systems, of course. One of the keys to reducing lameness in every dairy system, whether it's pasture or inside, is to reduce the forces on the feet, as we're um, talking in this um, webinar. This is one of the four success factors that AHDB have in their um, Healthy Feet program, reducing pressures on the feet. And it's the same with our Dairy NZ program. So with all systems, it's important. I've been fascinated with the work of John Huxley and others. I watched his last webinar. I think it's one of the recent ones of AHDB on what is happening on the inside of the cow's foot the pressures from inside. I've got there the, um, the importance of the fat pad or the digital cushion as a shock absorber was one of the things I learned. The fact that two-year-old heifers carve with an underdeveloped foot pad or foot pads, fat pads I mean. The third thing is that a cow that loses weight loses some of the protection of the fat pads. So John raised the question, does it? thin cow get lame or a lame cow get thin. Maybe it's the thin cow. The fourth thing was the softening of the ligaments at calving, allowing the pedal bone to sink. So in this picture that I got in front of you there, all these things end up with that pedal bone pushing down on the sole. And that's just happening in, of course, in um, pasture-based ones as well. Add to all these things, Long standing times on hard surfaces and lameness from solar ulcers can be one of the outcome. This is damage, I call it, I don't know if I'm exactly right, but damage from the inside, if you like, one way of thinking of it. These things are happening in the claws of indoor cows on concrete. They must also be present in cows on pasture. Every cow calves, so these things happen around calving time. 
But the interesting observation is that lameness from solar ulcers in cows in, on pasture is so much lower than the figures I see for indoor cows. Something else is going on. The predominant lameness seen in cows on pasture is white line separation and soul injury. These are injuries due to pressures from the outside of the foot, if you like. Just my simple way of thinking as a veterinarian. Here's a photo. I've just put a photo in front of one of the farmers in my area, just close to my home. Have a look on, these, on, this, on this picture. You can see a whole lot of risks for, that can cause our main lameness. On this farm, I've got a picture there on the left of a white line injury and a sole injury on the right. On this farm, 60% of his lameness was white line injury and sole injury was 20%. So 80% of his lameness was from two conditions. These forces on, on this picture, I'm just going to look at, when I look at that picture, I can see all the risk factors for wearing the soles. For example, look at the pressure as, as the cows possibly come around that corner. Another risk could be, can you see the dog down there? Look at the dog. Now, of course, he's on good behavior because I'm watching. <laughs> Maybe the farmer on the motorbike is on good behavior today. But I write it down as a possible risk factor if he puts pressure on those cows. If he puts pressure on those cows, that pressure really is expressed in pressure in the feet, damaging the outside, pressure from outside of the claw capsule, as compared to the ones that are also going on inside soon after calving from inside, inside the foot. There there are so many factors that, that can result in pressure or damage to the white line and sole. These pressures are magnified when there's herding pressure. They're there anyway, but with herding pressure, all the risk factors are multiplied. This makes reducing pressure in pastoral systems really important. Reducing pressure on the herd, I mean. Tonight, I want to concentrate on reducing the risk of herding pressure on the cow. Because when you put pressure on the cow, you increase that pressure on the foot, as I was just saying. The first question I ask is, I've written it at the bottom there, why do people put pressure on cows? Why do people put pressure on the herd? Pressure is usually put on a herd when I talk to farmers because they've got poor cow flow. So in this circle, if you like, this vicious circle, or maybe whatever you call it, people put pressure on the cows because of poor cow flow. If it doesn't improve, they become impatient and put more pressure. So you get this cycle going on. Let's just watch a video of this. This is one of my farmers. I went to this farm to investigate a white line problem, a huge white line problem. Let's look at this video together now. <clears throat> Farmer comes out, the rows aren't full because he is convinced that if he fills the rows, milking will be quicker. He calls it poor cow flow because there's four or five cows at the end of the bales, not in there. He's come out, I just timed that, 32 seconds to do what we saw there. And he's convinced that by coming out, he speeds up milking, improves cow flow. But I had to tell him, really, what I see happening in, with, with your farm is that you're actually slowing down milking. And when we look at him, there's a whole lot of things going wrong. Um, first of all, he's not understanding what's happening with the cows in front of him. So there's my pointer. The ones in front of him weren't doing what he expected. But did you watch? We're going to play it again real quick. What's happening with all these cows behind him? He's got a herd of 500 cows, but look at the ones that are under pressure behind him. His coming out affects them as well, not just the cows in front. Look at the movement of all those cows behind him. The ones turn to the right and walk back into the other cows, all the heads up. Can you imagine the pressures on the feet of nearly all of those 52 cows? Every time he comes out to improve cow flow, he's actually putting pressure on the feet 
and increasing the risk of white line injury, separation of the soul from the wall. In the last, in that video we just watched, I call it the frustration video, there were four things going on that the farmer needed to understand. The first thing was he needed to understand the cow. He didn't understand the keys to understanding a dairy cow. I also wanted to show him what happens when you put people with a cow. Then I wanted to show him what was going on behind him. He wasn't even aware of the herd behind him. He didn't understand what things were going wrong there and what happened when he came out to the herd. So let's just start with the cow. We're going to teach him nine behaviours or nine keys to understanding the dairy cow to help him reduce his problem. Let's start with the cow. The first thing I want to teach him about the cow is that the cow is an animal of prey. Cows are always trying to decide, am I a friend or a predator? Let's have a look at, I said to him, really his whole herd was a highly aroused herd. Let's have a look at this picture that I, I found um, from um, Miriam Parker showed me this one a few years ago. We want to keep the cow, the whole herd, in a low state of arousal. So that square in the middle is where most of our cows are. They're grazing, walking. We wake them up to bring them to the milking parlour, but we don't want the fear level to arouse, uh, the arousal level to go up because that's when the cow's afraid. When they're afraid. They don't think about their feet. They're frightened. So that's the first thing. The second thing I wanted to teach him is about those cows in front of him were seeing the world differently to him. Their eyes are on the side of their head because they're a predator. They've only got a small overlap of their eyes in the front, that binocular area we call it. They can basically see in a full circle with one eye, but only a small overlap in the front and look at the back, the blind spot at the back. Guess where our Mr. Frustration was standing? He was standing right in the blind spot, which is no problem to a cow. It can turn its head just a little bit to have a look at him. But guess where it walks? It's going to walk forward, looking at him behind him. It's not going to walk straight. It walks off to the side, turns around and goes to the back, just like what was happening with him. The interesting thing with our farmer there were two farmers milking there. The one, the cows were afraid of. The other one, they were not afraid of. The problem with our farmer that they were afraid of, he came too quickly out of the milking parlour. The cows would have, if he'd have talked to them as he came out, they would turn and look with their both eyes to judge how fast he's coming and who it was. Cows need both eyes to define more exactly speed and distance. Look at this video of a cow here. Let's bring this video up in the corner. Of a cow that I was videoing with a hidden camera. All that herd had walked past and hadn't seen the camera hidden in a bush. But this one, the smart cow, came past and saw something with one eye that was unusual. She turns her eye to look with both eyes to really define what's going on. But my point is she needs time to turn and look. About three seconds, as we'll see. And I said to the farmer, your cow needed these three seconds. You see that? She took that time and with both eyes she suddenly saw something different. Look. You see that reaction? When both eyes could see, his cows needed that time. He was in too much of a rush and frightened his cows. Okay, so that's the second um, key to understand the cow. Panoramic vision. The third one is the head position. Cows need their head down. His cows were all turning and putting their head up. When a cow's head is up, it's not thinking about its feet. It wants to look where to safely place its feet. As we see in this video, a cow normally in the sun, in the, in the daylight on a clean pass, clean pat, uh, track, its back foot safe because it lands in the same place as the front foot. Look, I put some rocks in the way. And with the head down, that's the point I'm trying to make with my farmer, it misses nearly every rock. Let's watch it again. Safely places its back foot where the front foot is safe, put the rocks in the way, 
and they missed nearly every rock. Farmer would say to me, oh look, mostly the cows are in the dark, they can't see where to place their feet. What about where there's cow muck and gravel and stones, they can't see where to place their foot. I say it's even more important that the head's down, because with the head down, she can respond to pain by lifting her head if her front foot stands on a sharp stone, for example, or dropping her head if the back foot stands on a stone. That immediately removes weight off the foot and reduces the damage. If the head is forced up, whether it's on a track or in the milking parlour, she can't respond to pain under her foot and therefore ends up with more damage, more pressure on the foot, more risk to damage. So there's the three cow behaviours, or key, or key um, understanding of the cow. Let's look what happens now when we put a person with the cow. One thing can be afraid of people. The interesting thing is cows recognise people. And I mentioned before that there were two milkers in that milking parlour. It was interesting as I watched that milking from on top of a tractor. Um, they were afraid of the one person, but not afraid of the other. They, the one person they recognised as distinct from the other person. Mr. Frustration, unfortunately, they were afraid of. I, I say to my farmers, when you have a new person joining your team, and those of you who are farmers out there, a new person in your team, um, they talk a permanent memory. If the first experience of a new person is fear, they remember that person for a long time. A new person joining his team must never give, be given a job like ear tagging or TV testing the first job with your cows. They'll remember that person for a long time. What other things make cows afraid of a person? Here's my list of things. Too much noise, shouting and whistling in the milking in the pit when they're milking. It makes cows afraid. Okay, the cows leave the milking parlour quicker and they think they're having a success, but they're making them afraid. Hitting pipe work with a plastic pipe just to help speed up the cows. They hear it differently to us. It makes them afraid. Fast movement, we've talked about that. They think you're a predator when you move fast. Coming out, out of the pit unexpectedly or coming too close to cows, into the cow's personal space like we just saw that farmer do. Let's talk about that personal space because that's the next behaviour that is affected when a people are mixed with cows. They have a fairly exact personal space. Let's just show this personal space in this video. These cows are tame cows, so I had to get the girl to approach her cow from the front to show that personal space, otherwise they just licked her. But you look, as soon as she touches it, look the head move. See how exact that personal space is? In the end, the cow feels the pressure, look what she does. She turns to put the girl out of her personal space. I needed to show that farmer that personal space he was entering without realizing it. The other thing is, as a cow turns, the cow is putting you often behind what we call the balance point. That balance point, if you're in front of it, a cow wants to reverse. It's a balance backwards and forwards. If you're behind it, they go forward. Let's look at this video of a farmer in South America who just understood these things without us having to teach him. You watch as he comes out of the milking parlour. He's milked 300 cows through that horrible old parlour without having to come out. The last three cows just need a bit of encouragement. See how he walks well out of their personal space, past their balance point. Look at that Frisian, she doesn't want to go. Past the shoulder and then she moves forward. As you walk past the shoulder that way, they go forward. If he overtook that cow, she would go backwards. He keeps out of the blind spot and she walks in. You can imagine there's no sore feet in that herd or no lameness in front of our eyes. Everything is so gentle because that guy understands personal space and balance point of cows. So there's our three cow 
characteristics of where do you pick people with it. Let's quickly now look at the whole herd. The key to understanding the herd is understanding dominance in the cow. Dominance cows are spread, unfortunately, throughout the herd. I used to think they were all at the front. I still I did some studies with my farmer's herds of 260 cow average. The dominant cow can be spread all through the herd. So if we look at this key behavior of cows that cows are followers, I thought all the cows would be at the front, but no. They're spread all through the herd. There's cows following along the track. And look at the one, the one in front here. Cows follow into the milking par parlor as well. They're followers. We must let them be followers. If they can follow, the pressures on the feet are dramatically reduced. As soon as we put pressure on the herd and they're not followers, we put pressure on the feet. Let's watch this dominance behavior in a herd here. Here's a herd coming to the milking parlour, and as we show this, there's a cow, we'll just point out to this cow that's a dominant cow, we've picked her out. You watch how cows will, she pulls cows behind her, I call them push pullers. They pull the lower dominance behind them, and they push lower dominance ones in front. When she stops, let's watch it now, as she stops, the cows behind try to overtake, and the cow in front, front comes to a stop, that pushed cow. She stops the ones behind her overtaking because she's a dominant cow. Get behind me, she's telling. And look how the one in front has stopped and is watching her. When she gets close, it starts to walk again. So the walking speed of these cows is set by dominant cows, not by putting pressure on the back group of cows. Putting pressure on the back group only increases the risk of foot damage on the back group. Cows are followers. The next behavior or the next key to understanding cows is that the walking order from the milking parlor to the from the milk from the cubicles I mean to the milking parlor or from the paddock to the milking parlor is one. They walk in one order and they change order to a milking order when they get in the milking parlor. You have a look at this. This is a British farm. I took a few years ago. Have a look at the following. If the cows are allowed to follow, if there's enough room to follow, you watch how cows on the left and the right that got there early, they're not coming onto the milking platform. But cows are following in lines to go in. They've got enough space, and that's the key of understanding this behavior. Cows need space. If there's space, there's less foot damage. If they're tight, they still want to follow through. They will push and shove to get through because they want to change order that they've decided. Cows need space to change order. What is this hurt? Sorry, I've got myself grotty. Um, when we put people with herds, what happens? I've talked about it, haven't I? Pressure. Usually, unless people are patient, we put pressure. We reduce that space for these changes and for cows to be able to do their normal walking, their normal behavior. What are the signs of pressure is the question I ask my farmers. The signs of pressure, the normal behavior is upset. That's the signs of pressure. The normal behavior is following, not bunching. So as I watch herds, either on the walkways or in the milking parlor, the first sign of pressure is not heads up. I used to think it was heads up. That's the last. The first one is following stops. So in that picture in front of us, if we showed that, the following through is non-existent in the herd in that picture in front of us. The second thing I notice, if we keep putting pressure on, putting more cows in there, the cows start to touch sideways. You say, that's normal. It's not normal. Cows will put up with it a little bit, but they don't like sideways pushing. What it does, it puts them slightly off balance, and they're afraid if they stand on things in among the mud under there. If there's stones being brought onto the, onto the concrete, they don't enjoy sideways touching. In fact, it's the cause of the next behavior. 
If that sideways pushing can, gets tighter, you'll see the next thing happen. You'll watch lower dominance cows reversing out of that pressure. They reverse to escape the higher dominance cows. They're afraid of the head of dominant cows and they will reverse. This also happens on the walkways. I've seen a biting dog at the back or a nipping dog or a barking dog putting pressure on the back group of cows on a walkway. And to my surprise, younger heifers and lower dominance cows will reverse back towards the dog rather than getting beaten up with the head of a dominant cow. So that's the third sign of pressure. And it happens in the milking parlour as well, in the uh, collecting yard, I mean. Finally, if we keep putting pressure on, guess what happens? The heads come up. So heads is actually not one of the first signs of pressure, but use it to help you understand what's going on on your farm. The last key to understand the cow is the key to everything I've put there. I should have put this one first. Cows are creatures of habit. They love routines. It's up to us to provide that routine. If we don't have routines, the cows don't know what to expect and the fear level goes up. But if everybody in the milking team does the same, within days cow flow will improve. It's amazing. Within days. Within two weeks, nearly every case of a poor cow flow situation, if people will all start in a very short time. I've got their um, protocols on my website, which is www.lamecow.co.nz. You can get that from us later if you like. I put there for you protocols or ideas so that for those of you who are farmers to look at with your team. Don't use those protocols as a law and say, you do this. Rather, get those protocols with your team and say, what should we do? What, what of these protocols, what would work in our situation? And if they discover them and you agree to do it together, you ring me up and tell me if milking doesn't speed up within a very short time. The fear level of cows drops when everybody does the same. Finally, let's look at a video. I'm going to show you a herd that was very similar to our man coming out, our Mr. Frustration, after teaching the, the team, this is a big herd, this one here, of 600 cows, after teaching the team all the things I've taught you today, look what happens. Instead of that pressure, that fear that we saw in the first herd, you look at this and tell me if you can see any fear in this. To me, this is like watching ballet. I love watching this video. My wife gets bored of me. Let's, Sandra, let's watch this video again. <laughs> but you have a look as these cows go in. I hope some of you, all of you have got the videos going. I know that videos are always a pain, aren't they, with these webinars. Some people's systems aren't fast enough. But have a look how cows come from the top, the bottom, the left, the right. I don't know why don't all those front cows go in. I call them 20 past 3 animals. They look at their clock and say, I go in at 20 past 3 or whatever time they choose. But it amazes me how when they can choose the order, Look what's happening, less pressure on the foot, less white line damage. Not, you know, it's all these things add, adding together, of course, but often the straw that breaks the camel's back is this area of pressure, just entering the milking parlour. Look at those cows coming from the top there, a little black one there, a, low, a small little cow, low dominance, finding her way around. There they go. Now an interesting thing is going to happen. This white cow here is a high dominance cow. Look, she looks back. It's 20 past 3, I think. Look, she's going to look at the others. No, nah, time for me to go in. You can tell from her ears she's thinking, can't you? Those of you who work with cows. She's counted. Place number 35 is now available for me. 
with that jersey down the bottom. She wants to go in, but she's not going to be allowed to go in. The one down the bottom here, can you see my marker? You watch her. She's thinking of going in, but there's an order here. Our dominant cow now thinks it's time to go in. I'm ahead of her, aren't I? Here she goes. She's going to push the one on her left forward, knock that one back, give that one a poke, because she's going to make that lower dominance go in front of her. She doesn't want that cow to come. She's going to knock the jersey down the bottom back, and then she'll go and give a backside a push for that other one to make the other one go in first. And what I love about this is that the cows are choosing the order. And you can imagine the lameness in that herd just dramatically dropped when we brought all these things together into less pressure on the feet. So just the final, there's our um, nine points that we talked about, the nine keys. Thank you very much. Excellent, Neil. That's uh, wonderful. Thank you very much for running through all of that. And I forgot to say that Neil's wife is also here with us uh, this evening, um, helping to uh, run these videos nice and smoothly. And we hope that most of you manage to uh, watch them um, OK. Um, so I'm just waiting for a few questions to come in. Uh, don't forget that you've got a question box on the control panel in front of you. So if you type your questions in, I can see them here. And then I can ask the questions to Neil and he can answer them for you. Um, so uh, just while I'm getting those, waiting for those questions to come in, I'd like to just uh, tell you that uh, Neil's uh, webinar will be, has been recorded uh, this evening, so it will be available for you to watch back on our YouTube channel. And for those of you that are new to our webinar series, we've been doing this for four years now, and there is a total of 46 webinars up on our AHDB Dairy YouTube channel for you uh, to catch up on if you're uh, new to uh, to our webinars. Um, so without, um, just going to have a quick look at my box and see if I've got any questions that have come in. Um, I've got one or two, um, one or two that has just come in. Um, so the first question here is, uh, Neil, how long does it take to change uh, the milking routine on a farm? It's an interesting question. It always amazes me how quickly it ch can change. Oh, am I speaking loud enough? Sorry. The question, how quick does routine, can routine change? Within two weeks, it can dramatically change. But sometimes it's even shorter than that, where all the team change their routine, agree to change their routine together and set up a new routine. Amazingly quick. Excellent. And Neil, you mentioned um, about uh, noise in the milking parlour. Um, what about radios in the milking parlour? Radios. It's a common question people ask me. Yeah, thank you for that question. Radios, often we see cows like this sort of music or that sort of music. What I, my theory is different, and I wish I could say this was science, but it's more anecdotes. I'm more of an anecdotalist than a scientist sometimes. My observation with radios is not what it does to cows, but what it does to people. If there's two people in a milking parlour together, milking, and one hates the choice of radio station of the other, it affects that person's behaviour. Now you can put up that with that for a while, but if it is annoying and the dominant person in the milking pit insists on having their heavy rock, and I like Beethoven, I can cope with that for a half, 10 minutes, but afterwards it affects my behavior. I found I've got that many stories of when we can get people to agree on a radio station, it will help both people, but often it means switching the radio off. If they can agree, I still say, have the radio not too loud. Cows don't mind loud music. We want to be able to hear cup slip and, and Cup, you know, think, you know, pulsator things, but it's what it does to people, and so I say, agree on the station or else switch it off. And milking changes dramatically because people are happy rather than fighting each other all the time. 
I have another question that's come in here from Julie. Julie, thank you very much for joining us this evening. Uh, Julie's wondering, are um, most of the problems caused by people rather than poor tracks or weather? Or Thanks, Julie. Really good question. I don't want to downgrade the importance of the tracks and weather and all those things. They are important. What I say to farmers is, if I answer this way, this one. If we have to do something immediately, we can't fix all those things today. But we can very quickly take the pressure off the cows through those poor facilities. And the foot damage very rapidly in decreases, the foot damage decreases. It doesn't mean we put put up with those poor facilities because we're asking staff then to be patient, to get up earlier in the morning, to take longer doing their job. So I see it as something we can do immediately until we fix those things up to then get good cow flow and not be tempted to put pressure on them. So they're both important. Just we mustn't think that fixing the facilities will do everything because I go to many farms with amazing facilities, but foot damage because the people still put pressure on them, even on good facilities. Does that make sense? <laughs> um, if often I get a farmer saying to me, Neil, I want you to come and sort out these workers. And I say to him, we can talk to your workers, but you've got responsibility because the workers say to me, can you sort out our boss? <laughs> so we need both sorted out. <laughs> Is that understandable? I'm sure Julie will come in with another question if she needs some clarification on that. Um, Gavin is also joining us this evening and Gavin is wondering, um, you focused a lot about the entry into the parlour, what about the exit? Have you done any work looking at cow flow on the exit or is it similar principles? Right, good question too. There's so many, the exits are usually the dirtiest part of the whole system. You know, where the cows go out and the, the exit track can be the dirtiest track. But I found that the exit, although it might cause poor cow flow and look bad, the cows are going voluntarily through it. It's not a huge cause of lameness. The entry is where we put pressure on them. The exit, they're going out voluntarily. So again, we don't just say, oh, don't do anything about the exit because often farmers say that's the worst cow flow in our whole system is going back to the paddock. And so they look at the exit. We want to have that good for the cows to walk on so that they'll go away and we don't have to go and encourage them to go away and put pressure on them. And often people blame the exit for poor cow flow where the, the, the real problem, like I was talking to a farmer today in one of my seminars, in the seminar here, that often Poor cow flow in the exit is because they're so well fed, they're not even hungry. They don't want to walk back. And often if they're going back to the same direction that they just came from, cows will flow on the same exit. They'll flow worse on the day they're going back to the right where they just came from. If you send them off to the left and they can see the paddock they're going from, then they don't seem to stand around. They're all run to go to that paddock. So a lot of ex so-called exit problems in cow flow problems are to do with, you know, they're well fed or they're not in a rush, but it's not a huge lameness problem, if that makes sense. Excellent, great answer, thank you Neil. And while we're talking about the exit from the parlour, um, what about the use of foot baths and how that can impede on, on cow flow? Any, any top tips there? Yes, foot baths. My experience, and this isn't from New Zealand because we have, don't have a problem with digital dermatitis. I think it's going to be a problem because we're starting to see a bit of it. But because it's what I've learned in, in Chile, where we had foot bars and we had to put the cows exiting through, divert them through a foot bath, we had poor cow flow. Where we built the foot bath on the exit, so they went through it every day, then cow flow improved. It wasn't a strange thing for them. They knew to go through the foot bath. So you might have that empty on the days you don't use it 
you still put them through the empty foot bar. And of course, I'm talking about a well-designed foot bar. Some foot bars are made to make life a misery for cows, and particularly the short plastic ones with big lumps and bumps and ridges and um, on the bottom. So we're talking of a well-designed foot bath on the exit doesn't hold cows up as much as if you've got to divert them on the foot bathing day. Does that answer the question? Yeah, yeah, I'm sure. Come, come back with another if I haven't been clear. Um, if, as far as design of the foot bath, we haven't got time tonight because you don't. It's another webinar mm -hmm. that AHDB have got. If you look on their webs, where do you yeah, look? that's right. So a few years ago, Neil did do a webinar for us on on foot bath design, and you can find that on the AHDB Dairy YouTube channel. So if you just Google AHDB Dairy YouTube channel at uh, Neil Chesterton, you will find the previous webinars that Neil have has done for us. One on foot bath design and the second one on uh, cow flow. Um, but if you do have any other specific questions, do uh, get them typed into those boxes on the panel in front of you, and uh, I can uh, ask uh, uh, Neil your, your questions. Um, so Neil, we have one more here, um, which, is, uh, which is easier to change cow, beha to change cow behavior or to change people behavior? I think you who asked the question, who was that? What was your name? That was Derek. Derek, you know the answer. <laughs> Cows are easy to, to teach new behaviour. You can change a, teach a heifer to go onto a rotary shed in three, three attempts. That's amazing. I don't know how they learn to do that. You're right. People are the hard part. But the key to changing people behaviour is for you, not for you as a boss, I'm not sure if you're a farmer or a vet there, but if you're a farmer, to tell your people, look, Neil said this, do all this, they'll rebel. What you do is you talk about it together, maybe watch this webinar a little bit, and then say, okay, you guys decide, what are we going to do in our milking parlour? And the beauty that happens in New Zealand is, if a new person joins their team, guess who becomes the bossy person to the new person? Your whole team not you. And so then it works. And so cows are easy to change. They're wanting, they so trainable. It's us people that are difficult, isn't it? Oh, right. The questions are coming in fast. And uh, now I'm, tr I'm struggling to keep on top of them. Um, Okay, so um, one question is, have you got any guidance about treating uh, granulation in sole ulcers? Do I have an answer for granulation in sole ulcers? You guys are the experts at this. I don't know what a sole ulcer is. No, I do. Um, look, less than 1% of the lameness I see is sole ulcers, so I'm not an expert at this. But um, I know from all the bets that I talk to and the little I've done in other countries, they are difficult things. And often, once they've got a solar ulcer, the damage that happens to the, deep inside to the bone underneath that ulcer um, doesn't go away. But um, so I wish I could say I'm an expert at doing this. I know you've got to get the pressure off, you've got to open that thing and allow it time, time, time to heal. So blocks and getting it off is essential. There's no magic potion. The cow needs time. It wants to heal it, but once it's damaged, many never heal. So if you're a farmer, talk to your vet. He's more of an expert than Neil Chesterton, who's happily inexperienced at the rotten disease of solar ulcers. Mm -hmm. Because of our pasture-based systems, we hardly ever see them. But um, we mostly see them when we've got an old white line injury with a turned up toe. So they get a solar ulcer at the back. So I amputate that horrible claw so it's not on the ground anymore. It's gone. My cow's walking on one claw. But with your solar ulcers, there are things you can do. And I've talked to you a bit. I'm sorry I haven't got any new tricks for that one. 
Right, so we've got a question in here from Brian. Uh, Brian, thank you for joining us tonight. Um, I'm presuming from your question that you are a dairy farmer, but Brian is wondering, um, or he's considering actually putting in some rubber matting in the back of his parlor to encourage cows to come forward for milking. And he's just wondering, Neil, what your opinion is on this and is it a wise way to spend money? Hi Brian. Brian, I don't know if, you're a, um, if your cows are housed inside or outside, but I've seen cows, I remember we were in Germany a few years ago, I couldn't believe the happiness, it's almost that the cows smiled. They looked like cars when they came onto rubber in their um, collecting yard. Now, I think the reason they ran, they, they were running around happy on that beautiful thick rubber. So there's good rubber and bad rubber. But my thought on that farm was I was pretty sure those cows had difficult time in their cubicles and in that part of their, their life. So the only happy time was when they got on the rubber. Generally speaking though, I say rubber, I've seen rubber up near the parlour entrance which encourages the heifers to come up forward. But as a general rule, rubber shouldn't be necessary as a, as a means of reducing lameness. Cows like it. Make sure if you do use rubber that you don't use get cheap rubber. It becomes slippery and becomes a danger rather than a, um, a happy place to be. So I'm always diff I find that question it's a good question because I find it difficult to answer. I think generally we want a non-slip surface in that collecting yard, whether it's a pasture-based system or an indoor system. Cows with, that have had, had got good cubicles and have had lots of rest, they can take that hour or hour and a half of milking. What they don't like is a slippery collecting yard. So some people put it in to stop it being slippery. And I say in that case it's an expensive answer, and, but the cows would like it, but make sure it's thick rubber so that the feet can 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 grip in it. So you know, two and a half centimetre deep um, rubber allows them to grip, and they love it. But it costs a lot, and it'll wear out. But um, it can only be a positive thing as long as it's not slippery. Some rubbers you get cheap rubber mats, and I've seen cows more slippery, particularly if there's a slope on that collecting yard, more slippery than the concrete that was underneath it and that increases the fear of cows. But you can get some really good quality um, non-slip rubber nowadays compared to perhaps when it first hit the market. Some of it was quite poor. Yeah. poor um, and there's some cheap imitations though still on yeah. the market, so, so just be, be careful. Be, be yeah. Aware. Yeah, be now, uh, the, the, I've just talked about the collecting yard. People often say, should I put it in the milking parlour, in a herringbone cow shed, for example, or a crossover one. Um, I always say rubber for people is more important than rubber for cows on their, on the, uh, in the milking parlour. They're only there for 8, 10, 11 minutes. The people are there for 2 hours, 3 hours, whatever. So always the people first for the rubber in the pit and then if you still want to put it up the top, put it up the top and if you want to there. Okay, great comprehensive answer. Uh, thank you, uh, Neil. Brian, if you've got uh, um, anything you want to come back on, just send me a little uh, question in, in the box um, and I'll, uh, I'll ask Neil. Um, so, um, Gavin has uh, popped in a few questions. Um, one is around uh, body condition score and what score is optimal um, for um, ensuring a good depth of fat pad um, in in the feet. Gavin, was it? Yes, Gavin, Gavin. You asked some awkward questions. In New Zealand, <laughs> we condition it, score our cows one to ten. So whatever number I say, you're going to laugh at me. But <laughs> we aim for for our adult cows in the middle. So ours is four and a half to five. I think yours is two and a half, somewhere around there. About two and a half to two, three. Yes, yeah. and so. Um, with overfat cows, we've got extra weight, even though we might have a good fat pad. What I understand, and John Huxley and your are experts, is it's losing weight that is the worry. So a thin cow, you know, below that two or two and a half, 
I'm sure, has lost fat in the pads. She loses it in her body and she loses it in the fat pad. That's why it's so exciting hearing this latest research. We don't want that fat to, we don't want to lose that fat because that's the cushioning of the foot. So we try and keep our cows in that middle range. Maybe I can come in here, uh, Neil, and, and, and help with a few points. Uh, Gavin, we've been uh, funding some work um, here at AHDB Dairy with the University of Nottingham and John Huxley. Um, and actually, John ran a webinar for us back in, in January on this very topic, so it's available on the YouTube site for you to have a look at. At. But Neil is dead right. It's about minimizing that uh, body condition score loss um, from calving to peak yield. So ideally, you want to be calving down uh, somewhere, drying off and calving down uh, between two and a half and three. And you don't want her losing any more than half a body condition um, score between calving and peak yield um, because that's when you will start uh, to increase the risks. Um, of having a thinner fat pad. And also just bear in mind that your heifers that are calving down, they're calving down with a suboptimal <laughs> um, a fat pad anyhow, it's not fully formed. So it's even more critical in your in your in your first calving um, heifers. Um, but as I said, you can always drop me an email if you want more information or um, uh, the webinar is available on our YouTube uh, site uh, for you to watch. Hope that answers your question, uh, Gavin. Okay, the second one from Gavin Neal is, what do you think the main reason um, are for getting uh, toe ulcers? Toe ulcers. Yeah. I can, again, I'm speaking just mainly from our pasture base system. It tends to be our heifers when they wear, when they skid or wear the, their soles excessively. When a heifer is under pressure, it's quite interesting when you look at their feet. On hard surfaces, the heifers tend to go up, my observation, on their toes, and that's when the skidding happens. So if they're fighting to get into a, um, a, a feed face on our feed pads, it's the toes that do the skidding. It's interesting to watch a cow. They tend to go back more, they've learned. They learn, they go more back on their heels to increase their gripping. And so one of the reasons we think we get these toe ulcers is on hard surfaces with our lower dominance animals, the front of the toe. And so it's uh, what my experience, the only, it's not science again, it's just observation and following up on farms that get them um, and looking for the risk factors. Do you, the other thing, Gavin, are you meaning toe necrosis? Because the scary thing is, in New Zealand, a toe abscess um, or a toe ulcer, they heal so quickly. We treat that foot, stick a block on the good claw, even though both toes are often quite thin, one will be the, the painful one. We stick a block on it, and Gavin, they heal up, and I don't see them again. I'm always happy to see them. Whereas overseas, where I see digital dermatitis involved, it infects that toe. And then we, I see what you farmers, I saw this in Ireland the week before last, when we'd been two weeks in Ireland. Toe necrosis, toe necrosis. The poor foot trimmers and vets and farmers trimming the toe, trimming the toe, trimming the toe. They just don't want to heal. That happens when digital dermatitis gets in there. Without digital dermatitis in New Zealand, in 43 years, I've never seen one single toe necrosis case. And I haven't found a vet, because I asked vets, I haven't found a vet who's seen one, apart from myself. So it's not just me being unobservant. We do not see them. Wherever I go where there's digital dermatitis in the system, I see those horrible things. Okay, uh, thanks, Neil. So Brian has just come back um, just to add a little bit more uh, to his query around putting in um, rubber in yep. in the parlor or before the parlor. Um, and uh, he said the reason he's putting it down is because the cows have to do quite a sharp turn to enter the parlor. Um, they're coping fine at the moment, but he's wondering um, could this be causing some long-term long damage to their feet? And uh, could it be reduced with, with the rubber? Um, 
Brian, the answer is yes and no, and no and yes. <laughs> what I mean, cows have no problem turning a right angle. It might upset the cow flow a little bit, or you have to be a bit more patient. The damage, in my experience, on that same bit of concrete we're talking about as they turn right angles to come into the milking parlour, is only if we have to put pressure on them. So if we use the backing gate with too much pressure, or if a person goes out and does it the wrong way. We can go out and help the cows in there, but if we do it gently, understanding balance points and flight distance and how a cow sees, you can, I've had milking parlors with horrible entrances and very or minimal lameness. But at the same time, I like what you're thinking. Rubber there will make it more enjoyable for the cow to come around that circle, that right angle bend anyway. So if you've got it ordered, put it in there. It'll encourage them up there and they'll be ready to go in. But even then, don't put pressure on them because I've seen cows under pressure slipping on mats. They won't get the foot damage, but they'll still be afraid. And we don't want fear in cattle because that upsets other areas of our cow flow. So go ahead with it. I bet you it'll help. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, so um, we're approaching um, nearly our, our hour, so I think just one final question um, for Neil, because you're off doing another farmer meeting tomorrow, is it in Shropshire? Another one tomorrow, yeah. Yeah, so what number is this? How many have you done so far? We did 10 in Ireland, and we've done five, six, seven, eight, nine. We've done nine here, so we've got four to go. Four to go, excellent. Wow, okay. Enjoying every day. So uh, <laughs> just one last question for you, Neil, then, is um, this um, a guy has a slippery uh, concrete, and is just wondering uh, what, what advice you may have for him. Okay, slippery concrete, what, it, what, what can we advise? Brian, you just had that question. If yours was slippery concrete at that entrance, you could put rubber on it. That'll get, you know, just imagine you have slippery concrete there. The rubber would reduce that. That's one thing you can do with slippery concrete. The second thing you could do is to, um, to cut grooves in it. And um, always do that with great wisdom, um, but it'll reduce the slipperiness. I always say I like small little squares, not big squares cut. Some groovers will just do one direction. And um, if, if that groove is wide enough and deep enough, the cows will grip. Um, in fact, you usually probably do it in the direction the cows are going because their feet tend to slip sideways. So grooving will, will help. The third way is to do scabbling, where a machine just takes a top one millimeter or one and a half millimeter off the concrete and um, it makes it non-slip. Now farmers will say, hey, that scabbling, that's going to rip the feet to pieces. It's like sandpaper. And it will if we put pressure on the cows. But our experience is you don't need to put pressure on them. When you've got a, a surface that's scabbled or grooved, that's non-slip, the cows flow voluntarily without need to put pressure on them. So they don't slip on that surface because they're not under pressure. So rubber, grooving or scabbling.